If you're a fan of all things automotive and you've got a case of the midwinter blues, we have the cure. A weekend in the Arizona sunshine at Barrett Jackson Scottsdale. I'm Bob Varsha. Each day gets bigger here at Barrett Jackson. Yesterday, we broke the $200,000 barrier. In fact, three cars tied at 200 large, including this 2023 Dodge Challenger SRT Demon 170. That was the top retail sale. The top overall sale was this 2023 Chevy Corvette Z06 3LZ that rang the bell at $220,000. And here's the kicker, every penny goes to a worthy charity. Now with that, we welcome you to Party Central here at Barrett Jackson Scottsdale. For 35 years now, the 400 acres of Westworld of Scottsdale has been home to the worldwide marketplace for automotive beauty, engineering, style, and speed. And this year, the 2024 Barrett Jackson auction has been bigger and better than ever. Today, we'll have better cars, higher prices, and more excitement up on the block for nine hours here on the History Channel and FYI. So let's get started at the epicenter of it all, in the auction hall, on the block, with Mike Joy. Thank you, Bob, and hi, everybody. Huge crowd here today already, and a very busy place. Well, everything is going up. The restored cars are going to be fresher and have a rarer combination of options than in previous days. The resto mods are going to be wilder builds, and so are the customs. But what's really going up are prices. Barrett Jackson has been selling cars today for three hours before we came on the air. And yesterday's top seller, we've already blown through that and beyond with a truck, no less. A customized 1977 Ford F-250 rolled across the block 15 minutes ago for $202,000. Expect today that six-figure sales are going to be more the norm than the exception. We'll give you a good look at these cars and trucks as they come across the block and an idea of our opinion of them, along with longtime Phoenix TV anchor and network TV pit reporter Rick DeBrule. Well, thanks, Mike. You know, I can tell people an awful lot about the great cars and trucks that will be crossing the block over the course of the next nine hours. But the reality is you didn't come here to listen to me. You came here to see the cars. So let's get straight to it, shall we? Up on the block right now, we've got a 1972 GMC Jimmy. It's a custom, and it's already sold here on our first car of the day at $52,000. Nice SUV, and they have been stars of Barrett Jackson thus far this week. Will they continue to be so? We will find out over the next two days. Now rolling up, lot 112.1, a 1972 Chevy C10 custom pickup. Trucks are always big here at Barrett Jackson. 72 Chevy, up it goes. Now this is a four-wheel drive, though it's described as a C10, which would have been born a two-wheel drive. Well, no matter, and very little of the original is left here. Here's an LS1 engine swap uh, transfer case. Willwood disc brakes. An awful lot has been changed on this houndstooth interior. Very sharp black and white presentation. Yeah, they've shaved the firewall, and I love all the great work they've done. They put on big brakes as well, so they've given this thing stopping power. It's got a better shock system. Everything about this has been improved. And if you haven't been watching us over the course of the last few days, I got news for you. C10 pickup trucks, especially the 70s, late 60s, mid 70s, these things are selling like crazy. C10 pickup are the hot ticket. These came in two flavors. Now they were all single cab trucks, no crew cabs like today. But you could either get a six and a half or an eight foot bed. Tradesmen like the eight footer for carrying capacities. Sportsmen like the short bed truck and still do today. Last year for the styling of this particular generation, it would change just a little bit in 1973. And once again, these 67 through 72 Chevy pickup trucks, the C10s. You know, if you want to buy one of these, in mediocre condition, you're going to spend fifteen to twenty thousand dollars just for a donor truck to build something like this. Wow, I'm with you, Mike. A hundred grand, ho oh, hum, but it means the world to that couple. Congratulations to them. Now let's join another member of our broadcast team. He's the host of Hoovy's Garage. Here's Tyler Hoover. 
Here in the staging lanes is the bidder's last chance to look closely over the cars before it goes and cross the block. And the consigners, they get to say their last goodbye, say a little prayer, answer some questions. And I was talking to the consigner of this 69 Lincoln Continental earlier, and they owned it for eight years, built it exactly how they wanted, very customized, but absolutely beautiful. The color is custom. This is the factory color, but they added a little bit more pearl and metallic. And in the trunk, you can see they fitted what looks like original luggage, but it's not. That's where they hide the battery and the air ride system, since this thing is lowered all the way to the ground. And this is a piece of history here, an end of an era, because 1969 was the last year of suicide doors. You can see the very original interior in there. And then the back door opens up the other way. So other than the air ride and a few extra little switches, it looks very stock until you look in the engine bay and that is a Chevy LS3 under the hood. So a nice modern power plant in a beautiful aqua blue color, classic Lincoln Continental. Wow, pretty car. We're gonna be saying that a lot today. Now we're back on the block for lot 1013 in 1973, Chevy Camaro custom coupe called Project Envious. And look at the number, already 160,000. This one was built as a corner carver with forge line wheels, big spoilers, suspension upgrades, and a full roll cage. You're not going SCC or NASA racing with this car, but everybody on the street is going to think you could and probably should. Yeah, it epitomizes the pro street concept, the, uh, the pro touring concept, the ability to go fast and then turn right and left and stop when it's all over. Underneath that hood up there, 427 cubic inches. It's got a six-speed transmission to handle 680 horsepower. I love the five-point harness seat belts in there, the roll cage. Everything's been done to make it look better and drive better. Boy, oh boy, that price meter spins. It's like a taxi ride in New York City. $180,000. And with that, we go to April Rose. Hey, Bob, right now I'm right before the pre-staging lanes. This is such a cool place to be because you can see all these cars up close. We've got resto mods, custom trucks, and ooh, very beautiful Corvettes like this C2 1967 Corvette. And you know it's a big block with that Stinger hood. Oh, that is so sweet. 427, 400 horsepower, four-speed manual, and it's factory. Ooh, that sounds good. Factory optioned with power steering, off-road exhaust, and my favorite red line tires. Now, this is one of only 1,096 built with this beautiful and unusual color combination of Elkhart blue over teal leather. I mean, this is the perfect car to drop the top, let your hair get tangled up in this Arizona desert. I am loving this day, Bob. As are we all, April. Who doesn't love a big black Corvette? So, here we are on lot 10, 13.1, a 2023 Dodge Challenger RT 392 Scat Pack, last call, shakedown edition, a new leader in the longest name competition. Take it, Mike. Well, Dodge has a bit of whimsy when it comes to the build out of these Challengers, but only a thousand of these wide body manual transmission cars were made. And Rick, this one's new in the wrapper, 12 miles on the clock. And I love the color, plum crazy, just about everything to like. You know, the concept was if we're going to go out, you know, if we're going to leave the Challenger and the Charger behind, then let's do it with some style. Let's enjoy the way we're going to go. So we've got these last call additions. We've got wide bodies, jailbreaks, all kinds of things. We'll see them over the course of the next two days. And $79,000 takes that one to its new home. And with that, let's take a look at our broadcast schedule for the remaining days. Today, 3 p.m. to 6 on the History Channel. 6 p.m. to midnight on FYI. Tomorrow, 2 p.m. to 6 p.m. Eastern on FYI. And on the History Channel from 6 p.m. to midnight. Be with us for the whole stretch. You won't be disappointed. Coming up soon, an amazing 1960 Chevy Corvette 283 270 convertible with all the goodies in a beautiful blue with white coats. Welcome back to Barrett Jackson Scottsdale from the Meguiar's vendor platform to the Meguiar staging lanes where each and every car of the more than 2,000 at this year's auction lines up with its brethren waiting for its turn on the block and it gets a little shine before it goes on. 
And now here's a car that almost ran me over in the paddock the other day. It's a 1965 Corvette Grand Sport recreation. And it's been knocked down at $60,000. Hard to miss it. Fortunately, so was I. Now here's an item you want to check out from professional football player and wrestling star and noted car guy Bill Goldberg and the Frank Teagues collection. This is a 1967 Plymouth Hemi GTX. Yeah, when Bill Goldberg is here, he's actually got a couple cars going across the block over the course of the next couple of days. You know, he's large and in charge. He's a big guy. He buys big cars, and this is a perfect example. In this case, it's a 1967 Plymouth Hemi GTX. Got that 426 cubic inch engine underneath the hood. And of course, it has made it up to a four speed manual transmission, but it's also got power steering and power brakes. Because you have to remember, the GTX was more of an upscale car as opposed to the Roadrunner, which would come out of the Chrysler world very shortly and out of the Mopar world very shortly. And it was the exact opposite concept. Let's skinny things down a little bit, take stuff off, and charge less money. Because the concept being, that those younger buyers wanted something that they could afford, but something that had performance. So as a result, fewer people were interested in the GTX and more and more people were interested in the Roadrunner. But once again, Bill Goldberg was a former owner of this. Now it's coming out of the Frank Teague's connection. I like this car a lot, especially the color. Beautiful paint job. Looks like you could sink in it up to your elbows. So the auctioneer is asking what Goldberg would say. Who's next? And it's a perfect combination. You know, I mean, you've got uh, you know, maroon exterior, maroon interior, and the red line tires. So from a looks perspective and a performance perfection, that's exactly what you want. Exactly what somebody wanted to the tune of $95,000 plus the 10% buyer's premium and applicable taxes. Great car. Now let's join Mike Joy. Thank you, Bob. Well, it's Friday, Craig Jackson, and everything is up. The crowd is up. The numbers are up. The cars are up. What are we looking forward to today? Yeah, we're starting to sell some of the cars from the Frank Teague's collection. Today you've got a 1971 Hemi Challenger. Ultra rare. So that'll be coming up today. We've got a uh, Cougar Eliminator with a 428 Super Cobra Jet triple black car. That's another one to look for. Some outstanding muscle cars are coming today. Uh, some K5 Blazers, you'll start to see some of those. And I know Steve wants to talk about what's been some of the highlights already. The prices on the pickup trucks and the price is going to keep going up. At the open, I saw you talked about some of the high prices yesterday, and today the high price was already a pickup. The SUVs and the pickups, the price keeps going up as the quality keeps going up. Steve, what makes a Friday car when you're looking over the applications compared to a Wednesday or a Thursday car? Well, Friday, by the time we get Friday, Mike, as you know, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we've got a lot of days. And what we like to do is have excitement in each day, but ramp it up incrementally. Friday is, a, is the absolute springboard into Saturday, so it's got to be something with some punch, with some wild power, but also something that has appeal. Diversification is key to the docket, something for everybody. I mean, we've seen a tractor with a flathead engine. We've seen uh, every type of vehicle you can imagine, but Friday is quality. It's the provenance in some cases, but more importantly, it's teeing up Super Saturday with a fantastic Friday. You fellas have been out there a long time. What have you seen that's really been a surprise to you over the last, oh, 24 hours? Oh, you saw uh, something like that. Uh, night, the modern Corvette made to look like a 1963. Not only had one, had two of them go over the block. They rang the bell. But the docket, having yesterday 254 Corvettes on a Thursday go over the block. The quality of the cars, the prices. One thing I did say, you'll see every soft, I'll say you're, you're asleep at the switch on here. I thought the two E-Birds were a little soft. And then you follow that up, and cars absolutely break the bank two cars later. So you're seeing the car market evolve. All right, and we're off to a great start for Friday. Thank you both. And thank you, Mike. 
moment ago, you watched a 1970 Dodge Hemi Charger RT out of the Frank Teague's collection go for $120,000. Now we're on lot 1016, a 69 Mustang 428 SCJ or Super Cobra Jet R code. So what happened to the Shelbys, the GT350s, and the GT500s of the 1960s? Well, tell you what, cars like this that were coming out of Ford, you had a 428 cubic inch Cobra jet engine with a Ram Air on the hood. You got all the style, and it came directly from Ford, and it was less expensive. And as a result, this car, together with the car that is about to follow it, really came to an end for those Shelby GTs. There was just no reason to, to buy those anymore. And although Ford had assumed production away from Shelby American, this was the performance. And by the way, you got to love this color, Gulf Stream Aqua. Very highly optioned car with the three S's, the shaker hood, uh, the spoilers front and rear, and the slats. Wow, 150 grand. We've got another break coming up. When we return, more great cars from Barrett Jackson Scottsdale. Stay with us. Welcome back under the big top at the Barrett Jackson Collector Car Auction here in Scottsdale. We're walking through the immaculate Frank Teague's muscle car collection, and here's another beauty, a 1964 Pontiac GTO. First year for the GTO option on the Pontiac Tempest. Silver mist is the color. Horizontal headlights, non-functional scoops, uh, chrome full cover hubcap, full cover wheel covers with the red line tires. What a great look. Yes, this is the GTO in its least expensive body style, the two-door sedan, or as they sometimes called it, a pillared hard top because the side windows were framed. Final top. Oh, beautifully presented car, as are all the cars in the Teague's collection. And one of the great debates of all time is where does the muscle car craze begin? There's people point to various cars from the 50s, you know, the Chrysler 300s. But there's an awful lot of people that point to this car right here. The concept of taking a simple car, you know, Tempest, putting on this GTO option. It's got a cool name, more performance. And suddenly everybody wanted this, especially when they saw how well it was selling. I agree, Rick. There were a lot of factory specials and limited production cars and special options. But the GTO, John DeLorean, created the first mass-produced, mass-marketed muscle car, and everybody wanted one. This has the optional tri-power, 360 uh, horsepower engine. Uh, looks brand new. Down comes the hammer at a mere $45,000. I think that was a pretty good buy, considering the circumstances. Congratulations to the new owner. No high fives, but you can bet he's a lot more popular in his row now. Now back to the block and lot 1017.1 from the Brian Frank collection. This is a 67 Camaro Custom. Well, we said the resto mods were going to get bolder with a lot more options. This has a full uh, Detroit Speed subframe and suspension, and boy, it needed it to hold this 572 cubic inch big block Chevy engine. So this will have a lot more performance than anything that came out of the factory in 67. What do you think about the 1967 Camaro was a very forward-looking car, whereas the Mustang was built on the old Falcon chassis. This was built on what was going to become the Chevy Nova chassis in the future in 1968. There were some, well, let's say compromises had to be made because of the way they were building it. But when you think about it, very forward-looking, nice chassis at the time. These days, they throw it all away and see how far we can go, use it as a template so they can build something more spectacular. Having a brand new chassis, brand Brand new engine under here, but we get to enjoy that 1967 body style. When I started doing uh, Barrett Jackson some 20 plus years ago, Brian Frank's dad Roger was bringing cars and restored tractors across the auction block. Multi generation family restoration business now working into its third gen, and what a beautiful Camaro. And that gentleman will pay $70,000 plus applicable fees for that beautiful Camaro. 
Now let's join April Rose. Man, I am loving life right now, hanging out with all these beautiful machines. If you ever get a chance to come to Barrett Jackson, this is the one Scottsdale, over 2,000 cars going across the block all week, just like this beautiful square body, 1970 Chevy K10 Custom. Now I love the look of these older grills with a stainless stripe that goes just across and the turn signals that are integrated in there. Now the next year, they went to that egg crate look, but I really love this old school feel. Now, this truck looks stock, but not under the hood. Right there, you got the LS3 with all the modern accessories on it and even a modern Camaro engine cover to dress it all up. Now, this one's also been lifted to fit these really cool 20-inch XD wheels, 35-inch Toyo tires, and inside, of course, has all the goodies, Resto Mod Air, Bluetooth, and believe it or not, this is a factory two-tone green and white correct paint. Everyone that walks by it keeps talking about how beautiful it looks in person. I'm telling you, you got to put it on your bucket list. Make your way out to Barrett Jackson. I think we're going to have to start calling you old school April Rose. April. Right now, coming off the block, a little extra pressure on the bidding. We're at $65,000 on a 58 Corvette convertible. First year with dual headlights, only year with the tusks over the trunk and the washboard hood. Red with white cove, signet red. I love that combination, especially over the black interior. Very cool car, 65 grand. I'd say it's well bought. Another break coming up, but the beauties are lining up to entertain you all through the day. We're at the end of our first half hour of nine hours total. Stay with us. Welcome back to Barrett Jackson. Things getting busier and more intense by the moment. Here's what the last three cars across the block did. And look at the one in the middle, a 58 Plymouth recreation of the Savoy that was the star of the movie Christine from the book by Stephen King. I still think it's one of the great car movies of all time. Sold for 160 grand. And right now on the block is 1019.1 that Tyler Hoover introduced us to, a 69 Lincoln Continental. That goes away at $47,000. Boy, oh boy, the fun is coming thick and fast. Here's our coming up car that we showed you before a recent commercial break. It's lot 1020 and 1960 Corvette 283 270 convertible. Horizon blue is the color. I know that because it was shared with the full size Chevrolet and my first car was an Impala convertible, a 60 in horizon blue, so you got to love this. Mine had a white top. This one has white coves. It has white walls, has the upgraded Corvette uh, four-barrel engine there with the aluminum valve covers as uh, Cliff drops the hood and a light blue interior. God, this is gorgeous. Oh, it shows off perfectly. You don't realize that just six years earlier, there were a lot of questions as to whether Corvette was going to survive. I mean, you know, initially it was a small production run of 300 the first year and another 700 the second year. And they wondered, well, is it something that's going to last? And here we are in 1960, and they managed to sell 10,000 of them. And suddenly the Corvette was firmly established. Credit Zora Arcus Duntoff, the chief engineer on Corvette, for continuing to push Chevrolet's revolutionary at the time fiberglass body two seater and improve its performance continually to the American public. The Corvette had what a lot of other sports cars didn't at the time, uh, a top that sealed the weather out and windows that rolled up and down. Looks like an internet bidder picked that up at 150 grand. Good to know that the cars I like are expensive and I'll probably never own one. Now we talk all the time about how big and broad and fun Barrett Jackson is. Well, just how big is it? Rick DeBrule, check the numbers. We have a record number of cars here in Scottsdale this year, more than 2,000, every single one of them crossing the block at no reserve. And while that's a pretty amazing number, it's only the beginning. Let's start with the auction site. Inside the fence here at Westworld, we have 83 acres. That's enough room for Grand Central Station, Windsor Castle, the White House, the Taj Mahal with plenty of room to spare. Under roof, we have 1.2 million square feet. That's enough to fit 18 football fields. Look down, you'll find 80,000 square feet of Swiss tracks flooring and more than 95,000 feet of cable to keep everything running. 
There are 274 vendors from six different countries. But wait, let's talk about something that's really important, food. There are 45 different food vendors with 78 locations serving just about everything you can imagine. But let's get back to the cars. You got 726 Chevys, 326 Fords, 185 Corvettes, 123 Mustangs, 115 Camaros. We have 61 Broncos and 31 Blazers. You want customs? 813. And of course, Ferraris, 23 of them. And the numbers go on and on. Bottom line, Barrett Jackson is huge in every way possible. Wait a minute, lobster roll? There are lobster rolls out there? Show me the way. Here's lot 10, 20.1, as the auctioneer tries to clear up a snag in the bidding. It's John D'Agostino's 67 Auburn Boat Tail Speedster Recreation. Well, I don't know if you can really call this a recreation as a stylized, upgraded version of the original Auburn Boat Tail. Of course, the Auburn Boat Tail designed to look similar to a boat. You know, Gordon Burek, who was uh, designing things for Auburn a long time ago, came up and stylized the original design. Now it's been taken to a completely new level. Yes, the proportions are similar, but uh, the car bears very little resemblance other than the uh, golf cart door right there behind the right passenger door. Yeah, that's what, where you put your golf bag. So there's an experience to go along with the purchase of the vehicle, and let's see if that propels the bidding beyond the current 92,000. You know, interestingly enough, when this came out in its original form, it was towards the end of the Auburn days. You know, ultimately they were wrapped up into the whole Duesenberg world, Duesenberg and Auburn together, and you know, didn't survive a whole lot longer. Quick backtrack at the end there. But it goes at $105,000, as you see right there, as the Summit Racing Sold sticker goes on the windshield. I like that a lot. So, here's something entirely different. A 2011 KTM Expo R Superlight. Yeah, they call it a crossbow, Bob, and it's, it's very, very interesting and unique. Has a coil over push rod, rocker arm, formula car style suspension. There's a lot of exposed carbon fiber. This only has 663 miles on it. I would say, Rick, it's a future collectible. And absolutely, and what this car is all about is power to weight ratio. It's got a 300 horsepower engine. Now that's not overly crazy, but it only weighs 1,400 pounds. And it's completely street legal. You can get out, you can have a massive amount of fun. Yeah, you don't want to be out there when it rains, but on a nice sunny day in Arizona, whipping around and enjoying some side streets, boy, this is a way to go. And once again, it's all about that power to weight ratio. Well, I know in Florida you can register just about anything with four wheels and a license plate light, uh, but check local regulations before you get ready to put this on the street. In some, um, well, these are four wheelers, so you can't really register them as motorcycles, can you? Or can you? I see a lot of them on the streets of my hometown of Atlanta. 70 grand? Someone will have fun with that crossbow. Here's Tyler. I'm with lot 1032.1, a 1989 Chevy K5 Blazer that is almost brand new. And with the blueprint engine cam, let's take a look under the hood. 5.7 liter V8, a few years into electronic fuel injection here, throttle body fuel injection, and this one only 20 miles on it, a little over 20 miles, original belts, hoses, everything. So clean, you could eat off this thing, which I'm gonna put my money where my mouth is right here. Delicious, but continue looking at this delicious K5 Blazer, all original paint, and then the interior is even wrapped new in the plastic. Just like how it rolled off the factory, so this has to be the nicest preserved K5 Blazer in existence. I mean, even the undercarriage looks brand new. And just to show you, here's another one. Wow. All right, 
we'll be looking for that, Tyler. Now on the block, lot 1021.1 is a 2020 Jeep Gladiator Custom Rubicon. Customized everywhere, most importantly, underneath the hood, where they now have a Hellcat engine that's bumping out 707 horsepower. And to get that power to the ground, upgraded 8-lug Dana 60 axles. Top speed tested, 137 miles an hour. Yikes. Uh, this has a 3.5-inch Mopar lift, upgraded brakes, 40-inch Maxxis tires. Off you go to anywhere you please. Yeah, exactly, and away this one goes. At a mere $82,000, plus fees and taxes. Really sharp paint scheme. Another break, and we'll return to Barrett-Jackson. Barrett-Jackson Scottsdale is much more than just a collector car auction. It's an entire lifestyle event, complete with rides, and Rick's going to take us on the Dodge Thrill Ride, our own version of the tilt whirl in, what is this? We got a Dodge Charger Red Eye here, making 797 horsepower. Oh, well, that should break the tires loose pretty easily, huh? All right, Tyler, here we go, boss. Let's roll. Listen to that Red Eye supercharged engine. Whoa! That's amazing. There's a lot there. It's hilarious. Whoa! Whoa. How's that, Bob? It's <laughs> awesome. Well, I'm coming out NASCAR style. Feel like I won something. Need a bottle of champagne. And once again, Tyler Hoover gets all the cool gigs. Meanwhile, we're selling cars. Lot 1023.1, excuse me, 1023, which just hammered away. A Dodge Charger, $90,000. Timing is everything. Now, here comes a 69 Camaro Z28. Well, this comes from uh, Mark Young, House of Hardtops up in Oregon, and he specializes in finding low-mile cars. And when he can't, he takes and completely restores them. So look at this. This is the Chevy Z28 Camaro, just like Mark Donahue's modified Penske version won the Trans Am Championship. 302 cubic inches, factory air reaction system, the smog pump, everything is in place just the way this came off the line, except this. This is the dual quad, dual four barrel manifold and carburetors. This wouldn't have come on the car, but you order it through parts, it would have come in the trunk. They had to homologate it to race them, and that's why it has this along with the four wheel disc brakes. Oh, this is awesome. Le Mans Blue rotisserie restoration. It's all right here. Yeah, I got that great cross ram with the uh, original Holly carburetors on top of that uh, great 302 engine. And I love the color of dust blue. Everything is absolutely wonderful on this car as it's rolling across the block. A Z28 from what could be described as the pinnacle year for this particular car in 1969. Restored to original by a longtime consigner at Barrett Jackson. Uh, who only brings faithfully original or restored to original cars. And this, with this base coat, clear coat paint, it, modern paint system looks much better than when it would have rolled out of the Chevrolet dealership in 1969. And when the hood was up, we could see that it had all those original engine markings like it would have come out of the factory. $107,000 takes it. I think it went to an online bidder who kept telling the auctioneer, come back to me, come back to me. Now, if you'd like to test your collector car knowledge and maybe grab a great prize, you'll want to go to play Fantasy Bid, brought to you by Dodge. Go to promo.barrettjacksonfantasybid.com to register and play. They'll try to predict the winning bid of select auction vehicles that'll cross the block tomorrow, Saturday. The winner at the end of all the 2024 Barrett-Jackson auctions will win the grand prize, a spanking new 2024 Dodge Hornet. And if you're really on top of your game this week and can predict the exact final bid of all 12 fantasy bid vehicles, you could win $100,000. It's the perfect 12 jackpot, so make sure that you register to play. In terms and conditions apply. You must be 18 or over to play. Visit promo.barrettjacksonfantasybid.com for all of the official rules. Back to the block. 
or something wild. Good 60, grief. Look at the front suspension on this. It has been widened almost a foot on each side to go rock crawling with what began as a 2001 Jeep Wrangler or 2011 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited. Well, what's the story on this? Well, according to the, the consigner sheet, apparently this had a problem of, you know, back in 2018 where it was 2014, I guess, it was considered a total loss. They took this and said, well, what can we do with it? And this is what they've built. And as far as I'm concerned, they've done exactly the right thing. Take a car that had a problem. Don't try to put it back on the street and just sell it again as a, you know, a salvage car. Have some fun. And I wonder how many original parts are left on this Jeep. The big sand tires that sit up there where the bed might be. My goodness. $80,000 takes it. Let's join April once again. Here's a car I know our beloved Steve Mignante, who is watching from home, would absolutely fall in love with Mopar or no car. 1970 Challenger RT 440. And it has a famous plum crazy color with the black vinyl top. Shows really well. You usually see them with white, but this combination is fantastic. Now, this also has a great engine option. The V code matching numbers 440 six pack, 390 horsepower, four speed manual with the performance rear axle. Inside has the really cool rally gauge panel with the tack so you don't have to guess how high you're revving that 440 based on the shake in the shaker hood and check this emblem right back up here. Now I know Steve would know exactly what they're called. I believe it's pronounced Fratzog and they retired it in 1981 brought back on the 2024 electric Challenger. Now I don't know how you feel about electric but I love the purr of these. You're never going to recreate that Bob. Yeah, but think of all the fun you'll have trying, April. Now, here is lot 1025, a 19, oh, excuse me, we're 24.1, just sold for $80,000. Getting ahead of myself here. Up rolls 1025, a 55 Chevy 210 custom two door post. Boy, beautiful the way this thing has been dropped. The chrome has been improved. Everything has been polished under hood. And it's a 210, so it's the mid-level of Chevrolet back in 1955. But that no longer matters because now it's a custom. Barrett Jackson calls this a two-door post. And the reason is the window is framed and there is a B pillar here. Uh, Chevrolet marketing would call this a two-door sedan. Same thing. Yeah, if you were buying a 210 back in those days as a coupe with just two doors, you weren't buying it because it was some type of performance or fun. You were probably buying it because it was just a couple you didn't need a back seat, or it might have been a business vehicle where you didn't think you were going to need a back seat. Could have been a government vehicle, but I love the fact that all these years later, it's now been turned, you know, from the ugly ducting into the beautiful swan. And the two-tone treatment here is factory. Uh, one color on the hood, the lower body, and the front fenders and doors, with the secondary color on the roof, the trunk lid, and the upper rear quarters. Not in these colors, but that is a factory two-tone treatment. I was going to say, there's really nothing factory about this beyond the concept of the two-tone paint. $60,000 takes it away. And if you go to Barrett-Jackson.com, you will see that sales price posted next to that car's slot in the docket. Because everything Barrett-Jackson can be found at Barrett-Jackson.com. Check it out. Buy some merch, buy some tickets, come to an auction. It is great value for money. If you just want to come, have some great food, and kick tires on a couple of thousand pristine cars. Now we'll move on to a 57 Chevy 150 sedan delivery. Now look closely because this is something very special. Uh, yes, it has, it's as born with 283, 270 horse engine, Carter dual quad carburetors, but only 92 of these were built like this. A sedan delivery would have a full front seat, in some case, the passenger seat was optional. And the rest would be a delivery wagon. And this area would be steel, not glass. Only 92 of them were built that year with side windows, as you would see on a two-door station wagon. 
So a 150, the base trim, a sedan delivery, rare body style in itself, with the glass windows, one of less than 100. Well, it looks great up on top. Let's see how it looks when it rolls over the chassis cam. As you take off, nicely done, 283 cubic inch engine, very stock looking, and you can see how they've pretty much done everything they can do. They've got that rust proofing down below, that oxide coating going across that differential. Everything's been done both up on top and down below. Well, the lift gate is not a new concept with today's SUVs. Instead of a tailgate that folded down, these sedan deliveries had a lift gate, so making them easier to load and unload with cargo. A moment ago, we saw the 210 cross the block. Talked about that was the mid-range. This was the 150. And frankly, when you were getting sedan deliveries, this is what you were buying. There was the only way to go because there was no reason to have a sedan delivery, a business vehicle that was a Bel Air. So here we have the question of if you're driving up Rare Street, do you get to the intersection of Desirable? Well, that's up to the bidders. Somebody liked it enough, $78,000. Yeah, good price, good car. Great story to tell your friends. Drawing close to the end of our first hour of nine on the day. Let's see what's up next, a 66 Corvette 427, 425. Well, when you got the big block Corvette in 65 and 6, you got this hood. This one has the optional turbine wheels, red line tires, and uh, exposed side exhaust with an M22 rock crusher transmission and 45,000 miles on the clock. Yeah, that's pretty impressive. It also has the original jack and wheel spinner knockoff hammer. So yeah, it's a pretty darn original. It's got its NCRS sticker saying this is what it's supposed to be. Okay, we'll interrupt. We'll have the result on the other side for you, but that puts a button on our first hour of coverage today here in Scottsdale, but we're just getting warmed up. Eight more hours of live auction action are headed your way. Stay there. Dream rides continue to cross the block here at Barrett-Jackson, the world's greatest collector car auction. Right now, we have $140,000 at the hammer for this 1966 Corvette 427, 425. I'm Bob Varsha with Mike Joy, Rick DeBrule, Tyler Hoover, and April Rose. Stay with us for the next eight hours on both the History Channel and FYI for all of the best of Barrett Jackson. Here's lot 10, 26.1, a 66 Chevy Nova Custom. Well, the Nova began as the Chevy 2, a car that Chevy rushed into production to battle the Ford Falcon. And this is the second styling cycle for the Chevy 2. It got a two-door hardtop, a much more attractive silhouette, and this one's had a heart transplant. Yeah, much bigger engine in there, six liter LS V8. Now cranking out 540 horsepower, and look at the stylized plenum across the top, the way they beautifully designed it with the paint going all the way through, and I love this three-color stripe going back down to the very end. And it's got a just a hint, when you get all the way to the back, just a hint of a little kick-up for a spoiler right there. Wrap-around bucket seats, and that paint treatment is carried through to the dashboard. Forged alloy wheels and four-wheel disc brakes make this one a bit of a corner carver and not just a straight-line car. And they've done some nice simplistic things, the way they've simplified this. This is just a simple bar going across the back. We're not trying to imply any bright work. It's nicely, nicely done, both inside and out. And, in fact, if you look in the interior, let's see if we can squeeze over here. Just take a look at how the stripe goes across. Six figures again, $107,000 for what is a very cool performance vehicle from the bow tie. Away it rolls. Here comes lot 1027, a 57 Buick Century custom convertible. Now this one has, one has been well lowered. And Buick wanted everybody to know that you had just bought a brand new car. 
And how did they show that off right here in the middle of the grill. There's the model year indicated. This uh, one comes out of Washington State and was bought here on the Barrett Jackson auction block in 2014 and then got this big transformation including the 425 cubic inch nail head V8. And we've seen more than a few of these go across the block this week with the nail heads and we can appreciate that. So many people are just going to throw a crate engine in there. And it's great. You can do a lot of things with crate engines, but I can appreciate somebody who goes through the process of rebuilding and putting an original style engine. You see the uh, four Venda ports on the side for the upscale models. Lesser Buicks got three. The red and black repeated on the inside, and we're at six figures once again. Oh, she can breathe. I was so excited about it. You got it, $115,000 plus. Now, we've been going on and on about Super Saturday. If you've been waiting for our coverage of here on the History Channel, you may not have been on FYI to hear us sing the praises of all the fabulous cars that will cross the block. So here's a selection of some of the cars that we think are extra special. Let's talk about Super Saturday with one of the most spectacular supercars of all time, a 2018 Bugatti Chiron, 16 cylinders, 1500 horsepower, zero to 60 in 2.7 seconds. And just to keep you safe, they have limited the top speed in this thing to 261 miles an hour. All right, April, what have you got? Not bad, Rick, but this is the queen of my heart. 1956 SL300 Gullwing, of course, with the iconic, beautiful, stunning Gullwing doors. Now, some would say this is the original supercar, which was born from racing with its tubular chassis and direct injection inline six. I mean, this is easily one of the most beautiful cars of all time. Bob, just try and top that. Well, thanks, April. And I'll have you know that our colleague Mike Joy calls me the wine and cheese guy. And I say guilty on all counts. This is a Mercedes Benz 540K from 1937. Now, in those days, you could have a car, buy a chassis, send it off to one of hundreds of coach builders, and they would create something original and likely to be stunning for your car. This particular Mercedes is in right-hand drive, which is weird because it was delivered originally in France. Go figure. Under the hood, that 5.4-liter eight-cylinder engine has that K in the title, which means compressor. It's more powerful than the normally aspirated version. But this car is all about style. It's red now. It was originally black over silver. I like this a ton, from the rear wheel spats to the front end louvers. This is something special. Tyler, what have you got? Well, Bob, how about a Lexus supercar? A 2012 LFA, one of 25 with the Nürburgring edition package, and only seven of them were in orange. 562 horsepower V10 that sings all the way to 9,000 RPM. Wow, what do you have, Mike? My high school dream car was a 67 Stingray convertible. Cars have come a long way since then, but look at this beautiful, just completed Jeff Hayes Custom. With its LS3 500 plus horsepower small block on an Art Morrison chassis, this gleaming champagne paint with the uh, ghost stinger stripes and a linen leather interior. All my high school dreams and more in a brand new 67 Stingray. Now that's just a sampling of what's gonna cross the block here on Super Saturday. Well, you get the idea. All of those cars and many, many more. But let's not put down Frantic Friday. Here is a 67 Corvette 427 400 convertible. We're at 95 grand and counting. Yeah, for all the right reasons, very desirable. 1967, one of the top years. Big block, 400 horsepower, and a great color, Elkhart blue. April Rose showed it to us earlier. $100,000 takes it away. Be still, my heart. What's next? How about a 1979 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am? Well, at Daytona, where this car was the pace car and was a favorite of Bill France Sr., uh, initially, they sent silver cars uh, to the track 
and they were hard to pick up off the sun-bleached asphalt in the banking. So a two-tone treatment was developed uh, with silver and gray and was applied not only to the pace cars, but all of the Speedway's Pontiac loner cars. And that treatment with the red and black pinstripes became quite popular for Pontiac as a result. Well, of course, what we really have to look at is up on the hood right here. Ten years earlier, when they had their first Trans Am edition, the Screaming Chicken was a little tiny thing. By ten years later, 1979, it was screaming in full glory. Turbine wheels, engine turned dash, formula steering wheel, all hallmarks of the Trans Am package in this, its 10th anniversary presentation. Sixty-five thousand takes it. Another break coming up, but not before you check out this 1970 Oldsmobile 442 with the W30 package. First 442 we've seen at this year's auction, and a personal favorite of mine. Check it out when we come back. With the stars and bars overhead, we welcome you back to the world-famous Barrett-Jackson auction stage here at Westworld of Scottsdale on the History Channel. This is lot 1029.1, a 1969 Ford Bronco Custom. Well, in the world of Bronco Customs, this is the package you want, the 302 cubic inch, the Dana 44, those three and a half inch lifts getting it up and those big 35 inch tires. This is exactly what all of the aftermarket people are going for when they want customs. And I love the seats that they've got mounted on the back end of this. There are any number of companies that will build you a brand new, almost almost all brand new Bronco like this, but you'll wait about a year to get it done and the price will be well into six figures or you can come to Barrett Jackson and buy one. There are more than 60 Broncos in this year's Scottsdale sale. Yeah, it really just boils down to what are you looking for? What color combination? What style? This one had a lot of fun with the way the uh, rear tailgate's been set up with a cooler and seats. $83,000. Boy, these Broncos have been running across the stage for big numbers here at Barrett Jackson. But that often happens. It's just a certain car and model and myth that captures the attention of the bidders. And here's the car we previewed before the break, a 1970 Olds 442 W30. A select offering from MS Classic Cars in Seekonk, Mass, well-known classic car uh, dealership. And on these W30s, probably the signature feature are these inner fenders. They are plastic, and yes, they are red, no matter what color car you've ordered. So the story with this build is, yes, it looks great, but it's what they went through to get to this point. And they spent years literally looking for new old stock parts. And we've been talking about NOS, new old stock parts, for a long time. The last 20 years we've been doing the broadcast. Well, once upon a time, it wasn't super hard to find those new old stock parts. These days, tell you what, everybody has scoured just about every shelf, every old building available to find all those new old stock parts. They're hard to find. More so, the Internet makes them easy to find if they're available. That's why the, the supply is pretty much dried up. Green inside and out, white stripes, highest horsepower year, 1970, the pinnacle of the first muscle car era. Love it. Even at $116,000. So while that gentleman does his paperwork, let's peek out in the McGuire staging lanes. Look at all the folks lined up watching all of these beauties roll by. Those may be the best seats in the house. That's where I opened the show from. Out of the bright sunshine and an absolute parade. Of fabulous cars. We go back to the block for lot 1030.1. 1971 Mercury Cougar XR7 convertible. Well, by 1971, the Mercury Cougar was no longer the corner carver that Dan Gurney raced in the Trans Am in 67. It had become a personal luxury car. And this one, one of five built with the Cobra Jet engine and one of only three known to exist, a full Concours restoration. 
on a very rare Mercury. Yeah, we come back up to the front. You know, people call this the shaver grill right there because it looks like an electric shaver. And to your point, you know, it was always longer than a Mustang. It was always supposed to be more of an upscale vehicle, similar to the Challenger compared to the Cuda. But by the time they got into the early 70s, the performance side was not nearly as important as the personal luxury side. 429 cubic inches, four-speed manual transmission, very rare combination in the Cougar, and with the drop top, one of only five built and just freshly concourse restored. So when we say concourse restored, this means restored to be judged at concourse exhibitions against similar cars restored to a high standard. Which means it's not just done nicely, it's done to the exact specs that it's supposed to be when it came from the factory. Solid money for a Cougar. No offense taken, Rick. $150,000, and that is one sweet ride. Let's go to April once again. Hey, Bob, I'm out here in the pre-staging lanes where everyone is having a good time gathered around this beautiful 1970 K5 Blazer. Now, we see so many Broncos restored. It is so nice to see the value of these just shooting straight up. Now, these were Chevy's answer to compete with the Bronco, but unlike Broncos, they were built on Chevy's full-size truck chassis, and they were just an instant success. Now, this one's got a modern LS3 V8 automatic transmission. It's been lifted with Fox shocks and leaf springs, so it rides better than when it was born. And I want you to take a peek inside Side. Of course, it has this retractable automatic step, all new gauges, and these picnic blanket plaid type seats. Man, I could just sit in there all day. You know what? In fact, I think I'm going to. So, Bob, just let me know when lunch is because I'll be hanging out here. <laughs> we'll come join you. Here's lot 1031, a 1970 Pontiac GTO Judge Ram Air 3. A very famous car, and it's called the Psychedelic Judge because this car was a mistake. You were not supposed to be able to get a mint turquoise exterior with these blue, orange, and pink factory Judge decals and the red interior, but somehow that's how this car left the assembly line, and it's been restored to just the way it was new. I always wonder, did somebody order it this way? Or like you say, was it simply one of those things where they went, oh, we missed, missed a number here and moved it over? Because I tell you, it pulls up and you look at that interior compared to the exterior color. Because I love the exterior color, but the interior is where you go, well, that's a little bit different on this particular car. 366 horsepower. I love the fact that they've taken that three-speed automatic transmission, rebuilt it, and upgraded it from the inside. So it is said the color combination on a factory WT1 judge option was not permitted, but this car was somehow built by GM of Canada. 3,100 miles since the restoration, and it's out of the Frank Teague's collection of just achingly gorgeous muscle cars. 92,000 to the bidder on the internet, and the Summit Racing sold sticker goes on. Price in the box. Psychedelic Judge. Here's 1031.1, a 69 Mercury Cougar 428 Super Cobra Jet. Well, look how much narrower and lifer and more performance looking this one is than the Cougar, the rather bloated looking Cougar convertible we just saw. So here's the 429 again, another, or 428 rather, Super Cobra Jet, C6 automatic, 430 rear end, and this one has the drag pack. Now that is a collection of options that include this oil cooler, and these are the parts you put on here when you're going drag racing. And this is a factory R code. When you look at this VIN right here, it does have the R in it, meaning this is the type of engine it was born with. Factory drag pack car, steel wheels, bucket seat console. 
automatic and vinyl top, which you don't often order for the drag strip. So it looks as if this car has led kind of a dual life, street and strip. I'm a big fan of Cougars and restoring these because so many of the parts underneath can swap out with Mustangs. So it's still available to find a lot of the restoration parts. Frank Teague's collection. And now, got a bitters up in the muscle lounge. So that bitter assistant has to work hard to get the attention of the auctioneer. Go back up front. Remember just a moment ago, we were talking about the electric shaver grill. See how much more subtle and small it was just a couple years earlier. $75,000. Call that well bought, I do believe. Now let's join Tyler once again. Well, here's a very cool customized eighth generation Corvette. The mid engine Corvette started out like this 495 horsepower, visually very much the same. The only addition on this one, you can see the Corvette racing skull here in the hood. But this one is well optioned. It's the 3LT package, Z51 performance package. But you see the stickers down here Stingray R. The consigner tells me that this is a Z06 killer right here. And the Z06 has 670 horsepower, but this one they put a Lingenfelter supercharger on it, and now it has over 700 horsepower. Since it's a convertible, you can't really see the engine, but he does have it running so we can hear it. Can you hear that supercharger whine? So cool. You got that right. Thanks, Tyler. We're at $90,000 on a 71 Ford Mustang Boss 351. Third one of these we've seen in this Barrett Jackson sale. This one blue with silver as the Mustang body got a little bigger and wider for 1971. Blue inside and out. And it's the right colors. You know, if you bought the Boss 351, depending upon which one you got, you would either have the black hood or, in this case, the argent colored hood. Argent, of course, goes back to the early days of Ford when they used to paint their grills argent. Well, let's turn to our wine and cheese guy. Argent is very simply French for silver, is it not? I'm with you, Mike. And I believe AR is the symbol on the periodic table uh, of elements for silver as well. Let or is it AG? Periodic let's table. make it AG. <laughs> yeah, AR is argon. And congratulations to the new owner of that sweet Boss 351. Now something interesting rolls up. You can find it on the docket, which you can find at Barrett-Jackson.com along with merchandise, ticket information for future Barrett Jackson auctions, and a whole lot more. News releases, everything you can want to know about Barrett Jackson is there at Barrett-Jackson.com. So, what do we have here now? La Carrera Panamericana, the Mexican road race in the 62 Jaguar C-Type Proteus recreation. Proteus in England makes these beautiful cars, recreation of, uh, recreation of the C-Type that raced at and did well at Le Mans and uh, leave the bonnet is latched. Oh, here it goes. So there's that big twin cam six with the triple Weber carburetors. Uh, it's the driver's name on this that I think will get the most attention. Who is the only member of Pink Floyd to have played on every one of their albums? That's their drummer, Nick Mason, who also has a Ferrari GTO in his collection. And he has driven and vintage raced this. Well, Nick Mason is a huge car guy, not just that he has a Ferrari GTO. He's not one of those rich guys who can just afford stuff. I've heard that his collection is worth upwards of $70 million. And some people have pointed out they don't think he made that much money in the band. So over the years, he's done a great job of building a collection and building value in a collection. I once asked him, what would you have done if you had not been a musician? He said, I would have been buying and selling used cars. And it looks like he's done so very, very well. 95000 for that one, and I'll support that. Nick Mason, a great guy. He not only has these fabulous cars, he lets other people drive them. I'm not sure that's what I'd be doing, but cool guy. Great drummer, great band. 
Here's a Chevy K5 Blazer from 1989. You know, every once in a while, someone gets the idea to buy a brand new vehicle and put it away new in the wrapper, hoping for future appreciation. I'm not exactly sure of the story on this one. We'll try to figure it out before it leaves the block, but it only has 21 original miles. It's never even been dealer prepped for sale and never registered. Yeah, it's interesting because we see here at Barrett-Jackson beautifully restored cars that look sometimes better than they were brand new. Now we get to see exactly what this Blazer would have looked like when it was brand new because essentially that's what we have right here. In the showroom, you got a preferred equipment group savings of $800, reducing the MSRP to $21,850. And look at where we are. We're six times that now. You know, it's always dangerous to buy a car and put it away. You just never know what's going to happen. I mean, and especially um, if you brought this to market 15 years ago, I don't think you would have brought nearly this price. But bringing it to market now with the craze of SUVs, with Broncos, with Blazers, people are appreciating it and liking it even more. Look at that number. Well, hats off to the consigner because he has timed it just right. $140,000 stock new in the wrapper blazer. Never have I ever. Or as the kids would say, boom. Now here's a car that's coming up when we return. A 1969 Pontiac Firebird Trans Am Ram Air 3. Subject to a complete restoration. And you'll see it in a moment. Back to the auction block at Barrett Jackson Scottsdale. Here's a look at what the last three cars across the block did. Lot 1032.1, an 89 Chevy K5 Blazer at $140,000. Those are pretty common numbers. Oh, speaking of which, we're at 142000 on this 1970 Plymouth Barracuda Custom. Great looking rest of mod. You know, we barely see these E-bodies roll across the block in white. That would make this one stand out. It's got a 392 cubic inch Hemi V8 with a six speed manual transmission. And of course, a great looking shaker hood up front. So that's a modern Hemi transplant in this one with the shaker. This was born the Barracuda back in 1965 or so. And in 1970, they had a Cuda model, just apostrophe Cuda. And that was the performance version. Pistol grip shifter, big money. 144,000. That man has the look of what just happened. Oh, now he knows why he did what he did. Here's another car out of the Brian Frank collection. This is a 1958 Corvette convertible. Boy, we've seen a lot of 58s this week with their one year styling touches like the faux louvered washboard hood. We call it under the hood something special. This is Rochester fuel injection Rochester division of General Motors a mechanical non electronic fuel injection somewhat temperamental back in the day but now there are specialists that rebuild these to a high standard. I've driven these fuel vets and the power delivery is very very smooth much more so than a carbureted engine. So what happened to the fuel injection. Well the reality was it was more complicated to maintain. Not all the average mechanics could do it. And basically, Chevrolet figured out with the carburation they were able to do in the mid 60s, they didn't need fuel injection. So a decade later, it was gone. And by the way, this is a great looking survivor car. Yes, you look at the tops of the fenders and you will see spider webbing, a uh, slight crackling here. But that's just age and patina after all. This car is 65 years old. Wished I looked that good at 65. 
283 cubic inches under that hood. They say this is one of only 504 made with that engine and this automatic transmission. By the way, the most expensive option you could get back then, heavy-duty brakes and suspension. Cost $780. That's a massive price, but people bought them, bought them for just one reason. They wanted to go racing. And they only sold a couple hundred of them. I think all that's holding this number back is that two-speed power glide automatic transmission. Although rare, most people would prefer the heavy-duty three-speed manual. And it sells at $75,000. Congratulations to the new owner. We've got another break coming up. And on the other side, more fun and games for Para Jackson Scottsdale. Welcome back to Barrett Jackson. Beautiful sunny Arizona day outside. Temperature hovering in the upper 60s. Couldn't ask for a nicer day to view fabulous cars across this century from all over the world. Fabulous stuff. And here's where it all comes to a climax on the auction stage. Here's what the last three cars across the block did. 65 Buick Riviera at $120,000. Plymouth Roadrunner Recreation also did quite well. And speaking of well, we're at 115 grand on a 66 Chevelle Malibu Custom. Well, SS427 is a badge the original never wore, uh, but that's what's been added to this one. A rotisserie restoration in the Pro Touring vibe and a Kinney built 427 under the hood. Check that number where he just hit $150,000. And for good reason, that massive 427 cubic inch. It's a well-loved body. First year of this particular upgrade for the Chevelle look in 1966. They'd retain it through 1967. And when you look at the front end of this car, you begin to see the hints of what's going to happen in 68 and 69, although the 68-69 body style would be significantly different. And guess what? We're still going. fought but one the number two sale of the day tying for number three of the auction and by the way that's a five make that a four car tie at two hundred thousand dollars thus far for number three now how about this 36.1 this is a 66 Cadillac Coupe de Ville custom EV convertible Tyler Hoover combed through it yesterday for us. It's an electric Cadillac. Well, okay, it's a Cadillac DeVille, but in this case, they've capitalized the E, so D-E-Ville. And you know, once again, I go back to when we first started getting the concept of electric cars, the Prius and stuff, we always thought, oh, they're not gonna have any performance in there. And guess what? They have massive performance these days. This thing has almost 400 horsepower. Well, you'll have to talk about range, that's a different discussion. But if all you want is pure power and the ability to be able to move forward, this can actually do it. It's got three inline Hyper 9 motors that can absolutely move this forward at a very rapid rate. And, you know, you think about it, with a big beast like this, the combination of what this would have weighed brand new together with the fact that they've had to add all these batteries. And if we can get our, come swing back up front and take a look at what we have under the hood, because it's absolutely going to amaze you. Is it beautiful? Is it a crate? No, it's just a giant logo. Nothing to see here, folks. Uh, because the motor and the batteries are all underneath. Very beautifully finished, however. That clip, white over red, and the steering wheel is a white mother of pearl finish. The gauges, the entire gauge panel uh, is all a digital panel. 
lots and lots of upgrades besides the powertrain here. Yeah, it's digital to look like an analog. I like what they've done with this. You know, there's a company called Revolt that takes old Tesla motors and puts them in new things. They put them into an old school streamliner and did 380 plus miles an hour at Bonneville. So if you have any doubts about the ability for an electric engine to produce power, you yeah, need to change that concept. Well, unlike an engine, an electric motor develops all of its torque, 100% of its torque instantly. And uh, yeah, that's, I mean, let's ask our Formula E expert, Bob. That's just got to be a tremendous game changer. And Chevy now makes a crate E engine that you can just drop in. $90,000 takes it away. Very cool concept, well executed. I'd love to drive that thing for all the reasons Mike and Rick explained. Now, a program reminder, be sure to watch SEMA Battle of the Builders 2023 on the History Channel tomorrow at 9 a.m. Eastern Time. Now we have a 67 Corvette 427 390 convertible. Last year of the Stingray and the 390 horse was the least powerful of the 427 cubic inch engines. And I love what the consigner has done here. He's taken pictures of the casting numbers and of the various documentation that you would want to see to verify how high you're going to bid on this car. I endorse this type of presentation because it's gonna mean more money. This Corvette was sold new in Canada, actually in British Columbia, so it's got the uh, GM Canada documentation to go along with it. This engine was a $200 option back when it was brand new. And $200 doesn't seem like much now, but it was you know, a decent chunk of change. You had to drop in on an already cool car. I think they only sold a couple hundred of them. So why didn't this car just jump to six figures? One simple reason. Well, two, that's the number of gears in this Power Glide automatic transmission. The ones that bring the big money are the four-speed manual shift cars. The Power Glide is a very efficient transmission, and with all the torque this engine has, two gears are all it needs. But enthusiasts clamor for the four speeds. Save the manuals is the cry. By the way, I should have said they sold more than 3,000 of these, not just a couple hundred. It was actually you know, a decent number considering how many were sold in total in 1967. Although total production numbers were down in 1967 because everybody was looking forward to the 1968 that was about to cross. One thing you didn't get in 1967, you didn't get the grab bar anymore that the passengers could hang on to when they were going full tilt. Right side of your screen. Lower box, the man in the white shirt front and center is noted car collector and car dealer, John Stalupi from Florida. He loves his Corvettes. He once explained to me that the Corvette was the first car he owned when he was a young man and got the resources together. Later on, he sold it. Later on in life, he went looking for it. And I said, how much more did it cost you to buy it back? He said, a lot. $102,000 was too much for John. Interesting. That gentleman has it. I'm sure that'll make his neck feel better. And out the door it goes. Here comes a 69 Firebird Trans Am Ram Air 3. First year for the Trans Am, Pontiac's answer to the Z28 Camaro, a car they wanted to race in the Trans Am series, so they licensed that name from the Sports Car Club of America. Paid them $5 a car, and for a long time, that was the club's biggest source of income. All of these first-year cars were white with Tyrol blue stripes, but I don't remember those stripes going over the roof as they do on this car, so we'll call it just a bit of a mild custom here. One of only 697 1969 Trans Ams. It's interesting because, you know, they took the Trans Am name, but in reality, they weren't very successful racing in Trans Am, especially for those first few years. Ultimately, did they win a Trans Am championship? Yes, but it took years and long after this car was produced. Titus Godsall Racing campaigned these out of Canada 
because Canadian Firebirds were allowed to race with the engines they were born with, which actually came from Chevrolet. The problem with the Trans Am to go racing is that big Endura nose is much heavier than the equivalent Camaro nose, and out on the nose was the last place you needed more weight on one of these. And what's not on the nose is what we saw on that 1979 10th anniversary that came across, the massive screaming chicken. You know, it was, hadn't even appeared yet. It wouldn't show up for a while. Well, it was there on the trunk lid or at the back of the taillight panel where you put the trunk key. That was the first appearance of the Phoenix or Thunderbird or Firebird, if you will, was right there above the name Pontiac. Well, successful racer or not, it certainly sells well here at $155,000. We've got a break coming up. No clouds in the sky today. It's a beautiful blue sky day in the Valley of the Sun. We'll be back to Barrett Jackson Scottsdale in just a moment. Welcome back to Scottsdale, Arizona. As you look down on Westworld, massive tents that house a big chunk of the cars up across the Barrett Jackson auction block. Some of the tens of thousands of spectators, bidders, families, pros, you name it, come here to enjoy all there is to see and do at every Barrett Jackson auction. Up on the stage right now is lot 1039.1. 1969 Camaro SS396. Well, we don't have the figures, but I would imagine that the big block super sport scene here was rarely painted butternut yellow. Uh, but that's the way this one is. Right down to the wheels with the dog dish hubcaps. Big block, big performance, interesting color. And not just the question of whether it was ordered that way. How many that were ordered that way are still butternut yellow today? Because obviously so many of people have taken these uh, 1969 Camaros and modified them. And guess what? We see a lot of them that come back and resale red or, you know, the hugger orange as the case may be. But to leave it in butternut yellow, well, that this is the way it was created. And I like the fact that they've kept it that way. Now, this is a four-speed car. The engine has been upgraded. However, still has a quadrajet four barrel carburetor and the original Muncie M20 wide ratio four speed. 100,000 is the number. That gentleman is the new owner. Now here's a car that April previewed for us earlier. It's a 1970 Dodge Challenger RT440. Plum crazy and I'm plum crazy about it. It's the right color. Dave Weiss has certified this saying that this was done to an extremely high degree. One of the great things about Barrett Jackson is they have a number of car experts that they keep coming to the auctions. And what they'll do is they'll go through and take a look at the cars and say, does it match the description that the consigner has given? So it's a great way. While it doesn't guarantee everything that's in the car, they take good efforts to make sure that they are what they are. They look at part numbers. They look at the trim tag for the option codes. They'll look at the broadcast or build sheet if it is available and while this one has had some upgrades and this car has been lowered substantially it's a highly optioned car pistol grip shifter full length center console between the bucket seats uh, vinyl top pretty car and what's cool about this is they also, in addition to, you know, having restored it to a nice degree, they have the owner history. They've got documentation that's followed this car, which is pretty cool. And whenever I sell a car, I always like to make sure that whoever gets the car gets all the documents I've got. Now, once again, they're just random cars. They're probably never, but I like to think it's part of the car's history, and it goes along. Well, as with paintings, provenance is important in the collector car hobby. Good point, Rick. The bidder assistant indicating I have the lead bidder right there with me. And he gets the car at $150,000. Huzzah. Now, part of every Barrett Jackson auction is our spotlight feature. This year, the year we're spotlighting is 1971 and its cars. Why 71? Because here in Scottsdale at 71 is when partners Tom Barrett and Russ Jackson, father of current company chairman Craig Jackson, 
staged their first Barrett-Jackson auction after years of a car show called the Fiesta de los Autos Elegantes. Now, all these years later, here's Tylee Hoover with a car reminiscent of 71. Well, just because a truck was born in 1971 doesn't mean it needs to look or drive like something from the 1970s, and that's what Sweet Elaine is. It started life as a 71 Chevy C10, but as you can see, it's been heavily customized. First of all, slammed to the ground thanks to the air ride hiding underneath this beautiful wood bed. The two-tone cab inside has a beautiful quilted leather bench, and under the hood, certainly the biggest upgrades here. 525 horsepower LS3. So Sweet Elaine is a beautiful custom pickup that you probably wouldn't want to haul things anymore in the back, but it certainly would haul ass. It's Tyler's sweet ride, and so is this 1970 Chevelle Custom Coupe. Lot 1040.1, we're at 110 grand. Well, according to the Kazana, they spared no expense in restoring this. Underneath the hood, they got a 454 cubic inch V8, four speed automatic transmission, made it to a GM 12 bolt. They got those 17 inch American Racing Magnum 500 wheels. Up 2,000 miles on the clock since the restoration was complete. And that gentleman has it at $105,000. Yeah, thumbs up. Okay, we are in 442 country here on this Friday at Barrett Jackson. Here's a 71 Olds 442 W30 convertible. Well, for 1971, General Motors lowered the compression ratio on all those engines, so they were a little less powerful, but no less desirable. So this is a 455 with 370 horsepower, turbo 400 transmission. Sterling silver is the color. They only build 110 of these W30 convertibles with the red plastic inner fenders, and only 10 of them had air conditioning. This is one of those 10. Whenever anybody tells you that they know what 442 means, don't believe them. Because the reality is it changed over time from year to year. You know, it started off as four barrel, four, you know, uh, four on the floor, dual exhaust. And at various points in time, it became various things. 400 cubic inches. The very last generation of this was a four cylinder. So for, you know, people tend to know what it was at a moment in time, but they don't actually tend to know what the entire history of it. By the way, I'm looking at the original window sticker here. Shows that this sold brand new in Lansing, Michigan at $5,670. Pardon me, this actually sold in St. Genevieve, Missouri. Well, it brings a big number. These cars are going for top dollar, $130,000. Really well restored. Back out to April. I found something really big right here, 1955 Chevy 5700. And it's really cool. They did all these airbrushing on the side. It looks like chrome, but no, this is all paint down the side. And of course, you have the fenders in the back that look like a 57 Chevy. This also looks like a Co, but it's not. It's all custom. The body was stretched to make room for the back seat, and a custom bed was built. It's got a mid-engine Duramax turbo diesel, six-speed Allison transmission, air ride suspension, and get this, it'll haul 10,000 pounds and still get you 20 miles per gallon. That's like unheard of. Now inside has period correct period correct gauges and also Tyler Hoover because there's actually a train horn in there. And <laughs> I was too nervous to try it out. <laughs> but obviously Tyler is not afraid of anything. This is going to be fun watching it go across the block, Bob. Yeah, the Corvette racing team used to bring one of those massive harmony horns to Le Mans every year. And everybody waited in the grandstands until Corvette sounded the horn in the pit lane. And speaking of Corvettes, here's one. It's a 2021 custom convertible. And this one has been well massaged by the folks at Lingenfelter Performance. Stingray R with 3LT and Z51 packages. Magnuson superchargers. So you have over 700 horsepower, a 45% increase from stock. Yeah, what do you do when you got a great car like the Corvette mid engine, high horsepower? Find a way to make it even higher.
Down comes the hammer at $85,000. Sinister looking thing. Here comes another break, and on the other side, plenty more great cars because it's Barrett Jackson Scottsdale. Welcome back under the big top at Barrett Jackson Scottsdale. As you can see, thousands of fans and bidders on hand down on the bidder floor, which is reserved to registered bidders. Fans can sit or stand wherever they like. A moment ago, a Dodge Challenger SRT Hellcat Superstock went for $100,000. Now rolling up is lot 1044 a 64 Pontiac GTO convertible. Well, again, first year for the GTO, which was an option on the Pontiac Tempest Le Mans, and optional was this tricarb engine, three two-barrel carburetors on this 389 cubic inch mill. The uh, stock engine had only a single four-barrel carburetor, and this has an M20 wide ratio uh, Muncie four-speed, the original 323 ratio safety track, Pontiac's word for positive traction, rear axle. And this is what you want to see right here, the build sheet that shows this is exactly what it's supposed to be. It's got Pontiac Historic Society paperwork. This is a very original car. You know, we see an awful lot of GTO clones from this year to see one with this engine with a four speed transmission restored to this level. Boy, this is a rare creature. Shipping order reproduction with all of the option codes that were put on this car. Provenance documentation, very, very important if you're going to get top dollar, and this one did. Yeah, beautiful car, $145,000 worth. Love a goat. Now let's take a peek at the McGuire staging lanes. You can walk up to that semi-truck display and learn all about the various McGuire polishes, waxes, cleaners, and so on. Longtime partner of the Barrett-Jackson auctions. And down there in the McGuire staging lanes, all of these beauties line up waiting for their shot on stage. And all that rumbling you may have heard a moment ago came from this, a 65 Superformance Mark III Roadster, the Italian job. So this car meant to replicate uh, the Shelby 427 Cobra and stylistically it does a pretty good job. These are not bumpers. These are the brackets for the quick lift jack. If you're going racing, uh, these little cantered fins appeared on some later sports races, but never on the Cobra. This is a fiberglass body car. The originals are aluminum. The originals sell for seven figures. Let's see what this replica will do. Well, this is said to be the fastest Cobra in the world. They got it up to 223 miles an hour when they were running up in Sun Valley, Idaho. Now, if you got yourself a basic original 427, top speed on that was considered about 167 miles an hour. If you had a semi-competition version, it was 185 miles an hour. The Super Snake original Super Snake Cobra was good for like 201 miles an hour. Of course, if you wanted ultimate top speed, well, for that, you had to go to the Cobra Daytona Coupe, because the reality was this was not a very aerodynamic body in terms of pure speed. It's very narrow. This car did that fast on that road. It is a great car. 80. So it might well be a single purpose machine for a top speed run somewhere. But the bidding is respectable here at $190,000. I think this may be the most I've ever seen a replica cell phone. What are the interesting things they've done? Look at this from an aerodynamic perspective. They put this in here. Ted Tormina is the guy who drove it to that record. In fact, he exceeded 200 not once, but twice. Two hundred and 
$20,000, our new top seller of the auction. Wow, what a car. And it now belongs to that gentleman as soon as he signs the papers. Seems remarkably reserved. Well, call it satisfied with his acquisition. And we move on to this, another one of my favorites, 56 Chevy Nomad Custom Wagon. When General Motors had their Motorama display in the Waldorf Astoria lobby in New York City, one of the show cars was the original Nomad. It had this station wagon style roof, but built on a 53 Corvette. Folks loved it so much, they said, we've got to build it, but not on the Corvette. On the full-size Chevrolet for 55, 6, and 7 was this beautiful two-door hardtop wagon. It had a very specific build to it. It wasn't just another station wagon. What was unique about it were a couple things. First off, it was only a two-door. Didn't have a, let's call it a C-pillar back here. Just had this holding it up. And of course, it had these chrome strakes up the back. You know, it wasn't that long ago, the concept of taking a an original Nomad and customizing it was like, well, why would you want to do that when it's so original? These days, as we've seen with 63 Corvette split windows, doesn't matter. People love modern stuff put into classic bodies. The Nomad name would continue through 1961 as a four-door wagon, but these are the ones that are highly prized. In this case, $180,000. You bet, Mike. From the Muscle Lounge. A feat in itself. Now here comes the 1970 Chevy K5 Blazer custom SUV. We've seen a lot of them. Let's see what this one does. Well, these were just workaday trucks. Why would someone restore one to this level, to this quality? Because all these people have come to Barrett Jackson to bid on them. This one's had an LS heart transplant. In fact, the valve covers on the engine here have been cast and molded to resemble the small block Corvette valve covers of the 1960s and 70s. That's an LS3 with 430 horsepower. And if you like this hugger orange, wait till you see the plaid interior to match. Well, just as the Camaro was a little late to coming to the game and battling the Mustang, the Blazer was a little late to the game in battling the Bronco. The Bronco was a big success, sold more than 20,000 its first year. But when Chevy decided to do the Blazer, jump into the SUV world, they decided not to do it the way that Ford had done it. Instead of making a shortened, single-purpose chassis, they put it on a truck chassis. We see the initial CST here on the door. Those were not the owner's initials. That's factory. Chevrolet sport truck was the package that was applied uh, to these Blazers. An upgraded trim level. A roll bar has been added to this one. Big wheels and 33-inch tires. It's been given a body color grill treatment and a cowl induction hood. And once again, finding a donor vehicle these days is becoming the problem. You're going to spend fifteen to twenty thousand dollars for a car that may not even have run for a while. If it's just a rust bucket, you're still going to spend five grand. Here's why people restore these Blazers, Bob. Oh yeah, one hundred and fifty thousand reasons to restore that Blazer. Now let's join Tyler once again. Well, if you're wondering what's the difference between that Chevy that just crossed the block and this GMC, well, really not all that much. Other than the grills, they were pretty much the same. But this one is a Suburban. And even with the Chevys, they shared the same name. This one, though, uh, nice and customized. And they have a really cool quirk that ended in 1972 this year that I'll show you in a little bit. But you see this one's been lifted. And you go down the driver's side, you can see that badge. It says Sierra Grande. So that meant the luxury trim for the Suburbans, and you can see inside, nice, luxurious interior, cool pattern on the door panels. But notice, this is a Suburban, so it's much longer than a Blazer. We are missing a door right here. It gives you plenty of room to do some beautiful hand-done pinstriping. And as we go around, that pinstriping continues. Big spare mounted on the back. But on the passenger side, this is what's weird about these. So the last year of the three-door Suburban. So these longer ones only had the doors on one side. This one somebody locked for me to be more secure. There we go. 
get you into the full bench seat because many of these were used for commercial purposes, school buses, that kind of stuff. Still has that luxurious Sierra Grande interior, but the last year for this. After this, the Suburbans had four doors like what we have today. This one, a beautiful example. Beautiful indeed. We got bubbling on the block, but we've got a break coming up as we cast our eyes across the showcase at all of these dream rides yet to reach the block. Welcome back. The action continues in our continuing coverage of Farrah Jackson Collector Car Auction from Scottsdale, Arizona on the History Channel and FYI. Nine full hours on this Friday to be followed by an extended Saturday program with the very best cars crossing the block. Here's what the last three cars to cross did, including $150,000 for a 1970 Chevrolet K5, same number for a 57 Bel Air. And now we're looking at a 1969 Ford Bronco Custom SUV. Well, this one has a Coyote 5 liter V8 aided to a six-speed automatic transmission. Somewhere I think the Navy is missing a whole lot of battleship gray paint because this has become a gloss gray at Barrett Jackson Scottsdale has been a theme of this week. And uh, of course the Bronco wears it well. Yeah, officially I believe this is called uh, titanium blue is exactly what they're calling it. Uh, you know, last night we saw one of the uh, new Mopars go across and they literally called it battleship gray. You know, you look at that rear fender, you can buy the sheet metal for these things for $250, $300. You know, you've got to do some work to put it in there. I was talking with one restorer recently, and he was saying, you know, why spend the 20 to 30 hours it could potentially take to get one of these fenders right when you can buy all of the body parts reproduced and make, save yourself so much time? The Bronco was originally available with no roof, a half roof like a pickup truck or a full roof like an SUV. But this truck is way, way, way beyond that. Nice air ride suspension, forged wheels, quite a build. And the bidders love it to the tune of $165,000. That moves right up into our top 10 of the day. Six to be precise. And now we have a 2019 Corvette Z06. I like how Corvette over the years has named their paint colors for racetracks. Maybe they didn't have the rights to Road America, so they used the town in Wisconsin, Elkhart Lake, where the track is. Uh, this is Elkhart Lake Blue. Last year, the front engine Corvette Z06 suspension on this one and less than 9,000 miles. You know, one of the cool things that they did with this generation of Corvette, the C7s, is they used a, a material that was developed by NASA. It's called Aerogel. And it's an insulation material, and it's designed to, you know, keep the heat from getting into the driver's compartment. But what's really cool about this Aerogel is it's literally 98% air. So it's exceptionally light, and the tunnel that goes through the transmission tunnel, the engine tunnel, is packed with this stuff to keep the heat on one side and keep the driver's compartment nice and cool. Just one of many instances where the aerospace industry has con contributed to uh, some great car building. There's that number again, $150,000. The Summit Racing sold sticker goes on. And away we go. Here's lot 1049.1, a 69 Chevy Camaro Custom. Well, this one has an Art Morrison chassis. It's got a uh, much bigger engine than it was born with. Look at that, 502 cubic inches. And when we, whether we talk about Art Morrison chassis or any of the aftermarket chassis that are out there, it's important to point out it's not just one chassis. They have multiple chassis for different purposes. All of the aftermarkets do. You want a truck chassis? They got that. You want a uh, SUV chassis? They've got that. You want a Tri-5 Chevy chassis? Yeah, you can have that made. You know, the, the same concept is the same in terms of design, but they're building it specifically for the purposes of this vehicle. Dark gray metallic exterior, houndstooth black and white interior, black vinyl top, and uh, Z28 stripes that would not have been available on a 69 Camaro that was not a 
Z28 D80 spoiler package. Some uh, Corvette crossed flags there on the taillight panel. So a little bit of freelancing going on here with this mildly customized and lowered 69. 125 thousand dollars as the rolling six figure prices just keep coming. Away goes the Camaro. Here comes a Mopar 2022 Dodge Challenger SRT Hellcat Red Eye Wide Body Jailbreak. Now one of my cutest details about these cars is right here on the splitter. This yellow piece is packing. It is intended to prevent damage in transit to the dealership, and then it's supposed to be removed. But it looks so cool there in contrast to the black splitter that a lot of owners say, no, 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 don't take that off. Leave it right on there. I like it. But you have to be careful because eventually it does leave a mark underneath. And so it's like, well, you got to be cautious as you do that. So what is a jailbreak edition? Well, over time within the automotive industry, when it came time to order options, well, back in the old days, you could pick what you want. You had a whole laundry list. You ordered the car and got exactly what you wanted. Then as time went along, you simply got packages. You got the entertainment package. You got the technology package. You got the performance package. Jailbreak, the concept was to build the car that you wanted the way you wanted. And it came from, well, the telephone world. You know, you'd get an iPhone and somebody would jailbreak it to put in a different operating system or change it or tweak it or put in various things. And so the jailbreak concept was that you could build, in this case, a Challenger exactly the way you wanted it with the options that you wanted. $110,000 as that sticker goes on with the happy news. Another break coming up and all kinds of elegance, style, craziness coming your way from Barrett Jackson. We are back at Barrett Jackson, world's greatest collector car auction its usual January place of pride in its hometown, Scottsdale, Arizona. I'm Bob Barsha with Rick DeBrule, Mike Joy, Tyler Hoover, and April Rose. And currently on the block is lot 1051.1, a 66 Corvette custom convertible. Well, yeah, very custom. Uh, but what's interesting about it from the outside, it has a nice resto mod look. And according to the consigner, this started life as a big block engine car. This was an original 427 cubic inch, 425 horsepower L72 car. Now, as often is the case, you know, cars with lots of performance get used and sometimes abused. Don't know what happened to it, but. Over a long period of time, it apparently lost its engine. They decided, well, you know what we're going to do with it? We're going to take it back to its original looks with a little bit of freelancing on the outside in terms of coloring and a few other things and just make it completely modern underneath. That's exactly what they were able to do with this thing. Well, the bidders are loving this, Rick. It went quickly to $135,000. Yeah, and I mean, once again, it's a mid-year Corvette, 1966, one of the favorite body styles. The next year, in 1967, it would lose some of the uh, the bright work on the outside, be a little simpler, but in terms of having the nice look, everything you're wanting, this is exactly what it's got. It's got a Tremec 5-speed in there. Look at that. And $137,000 uh, $37, takes it on a little bit of a count back there. Tyler showed us that car earlier. Right out of the MS Classic Cars collection. Here's another car that Tyler had a close look at, a 72 GMC Suburban custom SUV. Well, as we've discussed, the Chevy Suburban and the GMC Suburban were the same vehicle with different badging. GMC sought to make their presentation a little more luxurious with a lot of chrome in the front, in the grill, and in the bumper, which on most Suburbans, the base bumper was kind of an off-white. Now, this was a two-owner truck. It was originally ordered in this hugger orange and white two-tone with the... Uh, Silverado interior and was later beautifully restored. I mean, this truck looks better than brand new. 
You know, I remember in the late 80s talking with a magazine editor about they were doing a, a you know road test and a whole series of SUVs and one of them had dropped out and they were trying to think about what else they should put in. And I said, well, why don't you put a Suburban in? They said, no, we're looking for something that's more family oriented. And I was like, no, no, you didn't understand. I live in Arizona. In Arizona, starting in the 70s, these were family vehicles. And obviously, as we've learned over time, the Suburban has become one of the ultimate family vehicles. Of the fact this one has a 40-gallon gas tank in there because, you know, you're going to burn some in some uh, gasoline with that 425-horsepower uh, engine and all that weight. Well, most of these were workhorses. My friend Norm Granger and East Granby, Connecticut had a whole fleet of these in school bus yellow because that's how they were used. Instead of the big Thomas, uh, you know, 40 passenger buses in rural areas, a suburban or a small fleet of them would do just nicely. As Tyler pointed out, just a three door. There is no passenger rear door on the other side. Just that one right there. Obviously, bidding hard requires sustenance. Well, you didn't want those school kids jumping out of the back seat into traffic, did you? That's why you only had the uh, third door on the curb side. Of course, the Suburban name goes a long way back within the uh, GM and Chevrolet world. You know, they started using that back well, back in the 30s. $68,000 at the hammer. And we join April Rose once again. Here's something you've been missing all your life. 2006 H1 Alpha Wagon. Check out this massive brush guard. It kind of looks more like armor. Very cool upgraded halogen headlights right up front. Now, this is the last and most desirable year for these civilian Hummers because it's the only year with the Duramax turbo diesel, which finally gave it the power it needed to move down the road. Now, check it out inside. I mean, you're miles away from the passenger. All that paneling in the center is the back of the engine and the transmission. Now the Alpha gives you these super comfy seats and tons of off-road features. One of the coolest ones, it has its own tire inflator to raise or lower the PSI at the flip of a switch. I mean, if you're in traffic, it doesn't exist in one of these puppies, Bob. Uh, many years ago, I was calling a ski jumping competition at Iron Mountain, Michigan, and it was so cold. So a National Guardsman providing security invited me to sit in one of those things. And you're right, you are a long way from the driver. Here is lot 1052.1, a 32 Ford Custom Roadster. Doan Spencer was one of the greatest of all the hot rod builders. He applied his talents to a 32, of which this is a replica. He did a 57 T-Bird that is now owned by my friend Ken Epsman, who also has the Chris Cord Monza IMSA car that Doan Spencer built. I mean, what an incredible craftsman and just unique touches that have been replicated in this 32 uh, by Brian Frank and his family restoration business. Let's take a look at it from underneath as it rolls over the chassis cam. You see that great front suspension, that Mercury flathead engines. By the way, it's been converted to 12 volt. They're using a 1932 Ford frame all the way out the back. Look at that. Wow, $140,000. And once again, it got there quickly. So the Roadster hits the road. And here comes a 32 Ford Custom Coupe. And this one's also been given the Doan Spencer treatment with the headlights really lowered here uh, with the little Nerf bar in front masquerading as a bumper. These finned backing plates for the big drum brakes. Everything chromed. Just, uh, just gorgeous. Now this has an original 32 steel body and firewall and original 32 Ford frame and cross member. A lot of replicas out there. This is the real deal. Come back over on this side. I want to show you how the steering works on this. It's so interesting. We're going to look inside for just a moment. 
as it rolls by and look down towards the steering wheel. See all that equipment down below as it comes out the side. Then it comes right here. Now normally you'd have that steering shaft going all the way forward. It comes out here, hits this, moves over to here, comes onto the front suspension, and that's how it's turning the front suspension. Literally, you could turn it from the outside if you had to. A lot of sprint car, sprint car stuff there, Rick. And a quick change rear end to boot, along with a transverse leaf spring, early Corvette style in the rear. There's a look at it. You have your pinion in your ring gear and the shafts come back here and you have a couple of spur gears that you can quickly pop that cover off and change to change the rear end ratio. such a simple build, but it's so perfectly done. $92,000 takes it. Gentlemen of a certain age that could appreciate that. Now here's a car coming up a little later on. Lot 1058.1 is a 1968 Ford Bronco Custom SUV. And even if you just joined us today for the first time, you know how well these custom SUVs have been doing. It's an auction, it's a car show, it's a history lesson. It's Barrett Jackson. All the cars are undercover here in Scottsdale. Some in this half mile long tent, fully enclosed, and others in covered tent storage on the outside. You can't even see the end of that tent from here, but that's where we sit on the auction block, currently occupied by lot 1054, a 67, 427, 435 Corvette. Last year for the mid-year Corvette before they went to the Mako Shark body style in 1968. Interestingly, while 435 horsepower was the peak you could get in 1967, it wasn't considered the peak engine. Of course, that was the L88, which technically was rated at 430 horsepower, but it was lighter, had greater ability to uh, go fast. Well, that's the one you want with the four speed and the 456 gears, $115,000. Tyler? I'm with lot 1063, a 1966 Jaguar E-Type, and with a blueprint engine cam, let's take a look under the hood, or the bonnet, if you will. It elegantly opens up to give this beautiful presentation of the 4.2 liter inline six. This is a very desirable year for Jaguar because you get the bump up in power with the 4.2 liter. Same horsepower, around 265 as the outgoing 3.8, but about 20% more torque. And you still have the triple carburetor in this year. Now, you go a few years later, you lose those triple carbs, it goes down to dual, and then the 1.5s and the 2s and the 3s get more, well, impacted by bumper regulations and other things that disrupted the beautiful lines of this Series 1 E-Type Jag. Now, this one looks like an older restoration, but it still looks absolutely fantastic. I owned one of these for a brief period of time, and it's amazing how modern they drive considering how classic British they look. Absolutely love them. Well, you're going to be up all night trying to sink those three SU carburetors on that Jag, but it will be well worth the effort. Here's lot 1054.1, a 67 Ford Mustang GT custom fastback. Well, what's interesting about this is it has some customs, but this is a real deal, what they call S-Code. The S-Code was the 390 cubic inch engine that was put into the 1967 Mustang for the first time, and in many ways really bumped up the performance game in the Mustang world. You know, up until this point, yeah, it had 289s, you could do some stuff, but this 390 engine really bumped it up. This car was sold new in Utah, the 390 big block with the four-speed top loader transmission. Uh, this one has coilover struts in the front, so very different from the way it was born. A uh, big four-piston Kelsey Hayes brake calipers up front. 
Ford replica discs on the back. And the great thing about 1967 is, you know, they enlarged everything. The engine compartment was bigger in the 1967. So you could start putting not just bigger engines in there, but better suspension than the aftermarket can do these days. Some people shave some of those uh, suspension components off and put in really cool stuff, but you've got plenty of room in the engine compartment for a 67 compared to a 1966. By the way, that 390 cubic inch engine, there are about 25,000 people that opted for that in 1967. Sold for $130,000. Lots of dream rides still on the way to the auction block here in Scottsdale. Welcome back to Barrett Jackson Scottsdale, where some of those cars out in the salon have sold stickers on them, and the rest are awaiting their turn on the auction block, but everyone will leave with a new owner in this totally no reserve auction. Here's lot 1056, a 56 Chevy Bel Air. Well, this was actually supposed to be the end of the line for this body style. 55, 56, they were planning on really bringing out what became the 58 Chevy in 1957, but they didn't have enough time to get it all done. They were also concerned that some of the other manufacturers were blinging up more than they had the ability to. So they thought, OK, what do we do? We'll take our 56 and we'll ramp it up a little bit. That's how they got the 57. But the good news is we now have what we call the tri fives 55, 56, 57. It doesn't matter which one you choose. People absolutely love them. This one is a custom. Coil over suspension. You see the staggered Budnick wheels. 19s on the front, 20s on the back. Toyo tires, disc brakes, full custom interior. And under the hood is an LS7, which is an unusual choice for LSs, and I love them. Came out of the C6 Corvette, 500 horsepower stock, and they managed to get a pushrod V8 to rev to 6,300 RPM very quickly. One thing I noticed that's different from a 56, say if this was stock, it's missing its hood ornaments and a lot of the chrome. I think it looks great on the nose without it, personally. We had one of the Tri-5 Chevys go across the block yesterday, 56, and they'd taken the hood ornament off, and they put it on the plenum up above the engine. So it was hidden underneath the hood, but they still kept it. You know, you look at that grill, they changed it significantly in 1956. They went from that Ferrari style in 55 to much wider. $132,000 and the hammer falls. You know, if you missed a car come across the auction block, you can read all about it, including the hammer price, at Barrett-Jackson.com. News of all the cars that will be on the block today and tomorrow, Sunday, and news about upcoming auctions as well. Rolling up to center stage is a professionally restored and customized 66 Chevy Nova. And Bob, or I should say Bob, he used to be sitting up there. Mike, you know, you called this a little bit earlier when you talked about the gray colors, the battleship colors. Look at this. We got another gray one rolling up onto the block. This 1966 Nova Custom. I love the fact that people customize Novas like this. These were the little guys. You know, this could have had a four or six cylinder engine in it. It wasn't considered a performance vehicle in its day by any stretch of the imagination. Unless, of course, you ran, managed to get one of those SS versions. So this was just a fun little car to get around in. Now, wow, well, they've got a six liter LS engine, five speed manual transmission. They got a McLeod Super Street Pro clutch kit, nine inch rear end. Lots of performance, and once again, we're going to call it Battleship Gray. Uh, the consigner would call it Ferrari Grigio Scuro, or Medium Gray in Italian, if you will. Well, whoever would have thought something that started as a economy car now is wearing a Ferrari color with an LS2 engine from, say, a Corvette, a C5 Corvette, Roadster Shop chassis, beautiful interior, New, this would have been maybe 2,000 bucks or less. Now we're seeing $130,000. Yeah, multiple of 40 or so above the original, of the original sticker price to be sure. $130,000. From Chevy to its crosstown Motown rival Ford. Here's a 67 Ford Mustang. A little bit of bullet style, although technically the bullet, I believe, was a 1968, but you know, sort of that semi Highland Green, we're going to call it. 
you know, and now it's got a manual six speed transmission made it to that eight cylinder engine. They've lowered it. Take a look un under the hood right here. Yeah, nice. I love the fact they've kept a Ford engine in there. It's beautiful all the way around. We talked about the 1967 and the significant changes and how that when they made the 67, they enlarged the engine compartment. And you'll notice one of the things that they've done here, they've shaved off the suspension components. Normally, you would have had the strength, springs coming down here, but it's very common with a lot of uh, aftermarket restorations. They shave this off, go to a much lower suspension so they can get a little more engine in there. Yes, you see the modern Ford engine under the hood. You have Highland green paint from 1968. Of course, on a 67 fastback body. I don't think that hurts it very much. And the wheels, even though they are newer and wider in the back, they look like something off of a 65 or a 66. So a really nice mashup here. It's almost 200 feet from the auction block to the muscle lounge where that bidder assistant is holding that yellow towel to make sure that he's recognized and seen by the auctioneer. But his bidder has walked away and the hammer falls at one hundred five thousand dollars. All right back across town to General Motors and we're going to move forward to 1968 and this customized Pontiac GTO. You know, a little while ago, we saw a Cuda from uh, 1970 go across the block, custom in white. It jumped out, and this is another one of those where you're not used to seeing in this color. We see so many of these that are, you know, carousel red or some of the other more popular Pontiac colors. Seeing it white really makes it jump out on the stage. Underneath the hood, that 6.2 liter engine, 525 horsepower. I love how they shaved the firewall back there. See the uh, cold air induction right there. Nice job both outside and inside using that white paint. Well, the GTO didn't have much chrome to begin with, so they lend themselves really well to what the kids call the stormtrooper treatment right here. White with all the black trim, black interior, just like out of Star Wars. First year of the Endura front bumper, rubber covered, steel backed. A little heavier than the chrome bumper, which was a delete cost option, but most of the GTOs came this way. And to Tyler's point, you know, it's got that white Endura bumper on the front, and they've whited out the chrome bumper that would have been on the back. So white from front to back. $82,000, and that GTO has a new owner. Next car rolling to the auction block is going to be a 1968 Ford Bronco, but to see it, you're going to have to join us over on FYI because that'll do it for our three hours of live coverage here on the History Channel. And if you want more, and we know you do, we're going to be here for six more hours watching Dream Rides roll across the Vera Jackson block on FYI. Now, if FYI is not your current channel lineup, contact your local cable provider to find out which packages include FYI. For Rick Tyler, April, and Bob, I'm Mike. Thanks for coming along for the ride. We'll see you shortly over on FYI.